Um, I took a wrong turn at the, uh, at the hotel. There's a uh, fair bit of development going on behind us. So congratulations to Adelaide for the uh, infrastructure-led recovery. Um, and my apologies to everyone today. I know some of you probably wanted to watch the uh, third presidential debate. Uh, I don't have any Trumpism in me or any Clintonism in me to, um, to make you feel nostalgic about that particular episode. But I do want to... Um, I do want to walk you through a couple of, uh, a, a, a couple of big points to think about. Uh, one of the things that's really making it difficult in public policy today is that there's no single anchor, no big organising idea for all the other work that goes around, uh, uh, that, that goes into public policy to sort of frame and, uh, as I say, and to anchor um, the big thoughts in. And we know when we look back on the 80s and 90s, the big idea then was coming out of a very, very long period of... Uh, of economic underachievement and you know, f scratchiness in the social sphere in the 70s that the big story in the 80s and 90s was about opening up, was about uh, competitiveness, uh, you know, injecting competitiveness into the Australian economy. I just want to run through a little bit of a history lesson here just to remind people of how long it took even for those big ideas to bed down. And the reason why I mention this is I think that there's... Uh, people underestimate how hard it is, even if you do come up with a good idea, how long it will take through trial and error of implementation to bed the thing down. Now, when we look at the model as we've been operating with it today, it's essentially four prices that used to sit on the cabinet table all the way through until the end of the 70s that got taken off the cabinet table and were left to the market to... Um, to, uh, to set, in a way. And those market-led prices guided politics rather than the other way around. Now, the first one, the floating of the dollar, people have to remind themselves that the, most of our uh, economic peers, most of the developed nations, had done this by 73. We waited 10 years before we got on that particular bandwagon. And from that point, it was, I think, another 20 years before we were learned to live with the consequences of a floating dollar. 83 was the float, 86 was the Banana Republic. I think by the time we hosted the Olympics in 2000, we were still struggling with the idea of a floating currency because it had fell below 50 cents for the first time in history. But I think in the first decade of the 21st century, bear in mind we're talking 20-something years after the event, we were finally uh, used to the idea of a floating dollar. The tariff debate, and this is the second of the prices that was taken off the cabinet table, the tariff debate, uh, debate began in the 60s. Gough Whitlam first cut them without warning in July of 73. And there the matter rested for another 15 years before the Hawke-Keating government uh, resumed that program in 88. And it wasn't until 1991, again, we're looking at a 20, almost a 20-year time frame to get this thing going, uh, before the sort of final round of big tariff cuts were announced in the middle of that uh, very deep recession. Again, it's a similar story with centralised wage fixing. It took us a decade and a half to move from a centralised model to one where it's an enterprise-based model uh, underpinned with a minimum wage safety net. And the fourth one, which is interest rates, interest rates used to be set at the Cabinet table, that took another 20 years to become the model that we understand today. Uh, the financial market was deregulated in the, in the, in the early 1980s, by 86, all the interest rate controls had been lifted. It wasn't until 1996 that the model of independence of the Reserve Bank was settled. And it was all the way through that decade that the regulation model, which is in a sense a half-step back model from the deregulation of the 80s, was sort of finalised. And it's around the time of the HIH collapse, and I think in 2000-2001, um, in which was the final prompt for the... For the uh, for, you know, for government seeking some sort of balance between an open market and uh, some sort of regulatory framework in interest rates. As I say, the reason why I put those four up front, these stories will be very familiar to a lot of you, but it wouldn't hurt to remind your uh, politicians that some of these things can take a long, long time to bed down. And in a world we're in today where you almost assume a permanent volatility in the political system, government's been flipped over every, every term or every two terms, that is an important thing to remember, that some of the work you're dealing in today may have another 20 years before it's finally bedded down. Now, I want to talk about the fifth part of the model, and I think this is the thing, if you're looking for something to anchor public policy in the 21st century, it's the fifth part of the model, which is the immigration program, where I think a lot of, a lot of the big questions we should be asking ourselves can 
uh, you can look for some answers. Now, this part of the model hasn't had much fanfare. Now, we haven't had a Paul Keating or a Bob Hawke or a John Howard or a Peter Costello. When we were interviewing for the TV show I did a couple of years ago, we weren't talking about the fifth part of the model because it was something that even then, I think, to my eyes, wasn't as obvious as it might be today. The way the immigration program works now, it's as separated from politics as interest rates, as the dollar, as tariff and as wages. And we've seen over the course of the 90s and certainly in the early part of the 21st century, the market dictating who comes to our country. Not the government, the market. And there's a couple of very important things to bear in mind. Uh, in each decade after the end of the Second World War to the end of the uh, 20th century, our population over the course of that decade, uh, over the course of each of those decades, would rise for about, by about two million. And a bit under half of that would come from overseas, from the net overseas migration uh, program. In the first decade alone of the 21st century, this is a number that should be familiar to a lot of people because it's been what's been driving state governments crazy ever since. We didn't add two million to the population over that decade, we added three. And the additional million, an additional 100,000 a year, came from overseas. Now, John Howard didn't do this. John Howard didn't wake up one morning and decided he'd literally double the immigration intake. Uh, the reason why we haven't had a press release announcing that is that it didn't happen that way. Once we moved to a, uh, a, a focus on skills, so basically two-thirds of all migrants, two-thirds of the intake now is skills-based, where we used to have a bit of a family reunion uh, background, uh, a bit of a family reunion bias up until the 80s. Once we went to a skills uh, driver for migration, once the labour market and the tertiary sector dictated uh, the, uh, the intake... Sorry I, sorry, I can hear some voices here. Sorry about that. Cheers. Um, once we had the tertiary sector and the, uh, the, employ the, the employers dictating the immigration intake, you went from about 80,000 a year to 180,000 a year. So that extra million people that arrived in the first decade of the 21st century has been triggering all sorts of mayhem, I think, at the public policy level. Uh, you see it in infrastructure, you see it in schools policy, you see it in health policy. And I know, covering state government budgets for the Australian over the years, uh, when I was still on the Australian, we had quite a, uh, an interesting little uh, exercise we'd run every year where we look at the budget tables. Population forecasts would always be undershot in the previous year's budget. The Treasurer would have to announce that, sorry, we'd underestimated population growth. Here is what we think the population growth moving forward will be, and even then they were undershooting. So all the service provision that was anchoring, that was, um, that was dictating uh, the decisions made year on year in state budgets was always undercooked because they weren't expecting the number of people who were arriving. Now, we might look at, we might look at the intake of the first decade of the 21st century and say, good on us, uh, but I think we misunderstand what's driving it. This isn't actually Australia going out into the marketplace and recruiting migrants at greater numbers than ever before. In fact, the greatest level of migration that we've ever had outside of the gold rush of the 1850s, it is because of the rise of China and India. It is because the um, external factors that are actually dictating our population flows in Australia. Now, the political implication of that migration flow is the thing I want, to, I want to zero in on at the moment. Because in, in your work, you'll know that most of your ministers, this is for the public servants in the room, you'll know that most of your ministers on any given day feel like they're drowning. They'll be picking up the phone wanting to respond to something that occurred that day. They'll be wanting a brief on something they anticipate the next week. When what you really need to do is to earth them, is to get them to think about the next 10 years. Now, of course, they aren't in a position to tell you that they'll be here in three years' time. They'll be lucky to see the term out because we do know not just governments getting turned over, but ministers get turned over as well. Within within the cycle. Now, the thing about the flows, the migration flows as they affect the country, is that three parts of Australia now, uh, sorry, is that the migration is flowing in three different and almost contradictory directions. The Chinese and Indian waves are focused on the southeast corner. And this is essentially a story of Melbourne and Sydney. Pretty much 80% of all the uh, intake from China and India turns up in Melbourne or Sydney. Think this thing through. When you look at the national snapshot, 28% of the population is born overseas. 
Of that 28%, 10 percentage points of the 28 are from Asia, and within that 10 percentage points, five are from either China or India. There are a million Chinese and Indian-born in total, Australians today, and they outnumber the English-born in Australia today. That's the national snapshot. But when you go to Melbourne and Sydney, you add 10 percentage points to whatever you're observing. So 28% of the population is born overseas nationally. In Melbourne and Sydney, it's closer to 40%. 10 percentage points of the nation is born in Asia. In Melbourne and Sydney, you'd go from 15 to 20 percentage points. Now, that's a really good story in the southeast corner. Essentially, the population flows in our region are dictating the success of Melbourne and Sydney in the 21st century. But if I move to Queensland and have a look at what the composition of the immigration population, uh, sort of the ethnic face of Queensland, uh, I don't see a lot of Chinese or Indians. I see a predominantly Pacific Island, uh, a Pacific Island and New Zealand. Uh, well, I wouldn't say bias, but basically that is dictating the immigration flow to Queensland. The number one immigrant group in Brisbane today are New Zealand born. They're not English born. They're from New Zealand. The number one immigrant group, mind you, in Sydney is from China, and the number one immigrant group in Melbourne in the next 10 years or so will be from India. This has never happened before. Whether you're a high migration or a low migration centre in Australia in the past, the latter would be roughly the same. You'd have the Brits number one, the Italians number two after the Second World War, and then from the 70s onwards, in terms of flow, not in terms of absolute numbers, in terms of flow, it would be the New Zealanders first and the Vietnamese second. In the southeast corner, we're looking very Eurasian now, and, and much quicker, I think, than a lot of people realise. In the north, we've got a Pacific identity forming. Now we switch to the west. The largest immigrant group in Perth today are the English-born, and in fact, the ratio of the English-born to the total population of Perth is at its highest level since white Australia. Now, this is a different kind of English migrant, by the way, to the white Australia migrant um, in the 1910s, 20s, and briefly in the 30s before the Depression interrupted. This is a new English migrant who, for whatever reason, skill set, uh, cultural choice, sees WA as the future. Now, even here in Adelaide, the English are the number one migrant group. So when I look at that snapshot, Eurasian in the southeast corner, Pacific sort of neighbor, Pacific neighbor in the north, and old mother country in the west, I look at a country that is actually moving in three different directions. I don't have a problem with that, but I think it does pose some very interesting political questions. Now, I think in the, in the discussion, we'll try and deal with some of the implications of the, of the migration program, but we have a couple of, um, a couple of uh, top of mind issues to think about. Because most of the intake that's going to the southeast corner is skilled, because most of it is skilled, because when you look at the labour market generally, pretty much every full-time job that's been added to the economy since 2008, this is the net addition, by the way, uh, has gone to an overseas-born worker. Within the local-born uh, labour market, pretty much you've got a revolving door going on. Retirees have been replaced by new entrants, but there's no net addition to the stock of Australian-born workers. It's the overseas-born worker that is filling the skills gaps in the economy and has been doing so since 2008. When you think about how the flexibility of that model works, this is what I talk about, the fifth arm of the open model, uh, by the 2010 election, I think some of you might recall that both Labor and Liberal were arguing lower intakes in that campaign. We had a bit of a population debate, in inverted commas. Scott Morrison, as, as the shadow immigration spokesman in those days, talked about reducing the intake. Now, I know Paul Kelly and I at the Australian, we raced each other to our computers to write the angry column that said how outrageous this was, that you know, for the first time since the, since the Second World War, we had a politician actually talking about reducing the intake for not economic reasons, just for political reasons. Now, of course, because the model remained open, that didn't happen. And because that didn't happen, we kept growing. So we can argue the toss about what got us out of the GFC, what kept us growing after the GFC, after the terms of trade had peaked, that is, after mining no longer was the dominant driver of our economic growth, Population has been driving our growth for the last four or five years. That's why we got to 25 years of uninterrupted growth. But the consequences of the program driving 
uh, the labour market, I don't think have been thought through in the political sphere. If most of your migrants are landing on the top of your social structure, that is, they look nothing like my parents' generation who started at the bottom and you'd measure the, migration, the success of the migration program through their home ownership and through their kids' tertiary degrees, most of the new arrivals are sitting on the top of the program. They're bidding up property prices. That's what politicians are thinking, and we know at the margin that is probably true. But we also know that they're taking the best positions in the economy, the best positions not necessarily in the society at the moment because the political system and the media doesn't look anything like the country at the moment. But these new arrivals are actually creating a risk to cohesion not because they're doing anything wrong, but because the rest of the country may not have thought about how it needs to keep up, how it needs to reskill the local born population to make sure that your kids, now I'm assuming there are some migrants in the room, but I'm speaking generically here, and I'm assuming a very, very white political master at this point, I'm assuming my minister is very, very white. How do you make sure that your kids keep up? When the way the model works, it's going to land the best kid in the world, firstly in, 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 in a private school, then in a university, and then in the best job in the economy. See, I think if you, if you adapt properly to what the price signal of this model is telling you, you need to lift everybody up. But if you just let the program um, answer the short-term question for you, is how do I fill this next job vacancy? How do I earn an extra dollar uh, in export income? to make the balance of payments look good? How do I tax the new arrival to make my budget bottom line look good? Then you've actually missed the point of what this step up in our migration program is telling us. It's actually telling us to step up. When you're going from an average intake, which was basically the story of the, of the second half of the 20th century, of 80,000 a year, around 800,000 a decade, to 180,000 a year, and in fact, on most recent data, even though it's, it's sort of tracking down a bit, it's closer to 200,000 a year. That extra 100, 120,000 people a year we are receiving are challenging us to make sure that the rest of the population keeps up with them. Now, Hawke, Keating, Howard kept lecturing us through the 80s and 90s about how the open model was going to prompt us to get better. This part of the open model is going to prompt us to get better in a way that we haven't thought of before. That's if we understand what it's telling us. So in, in, the, in the sort of physical business of government, especially at the state level, you've got infrastructure issues, you've got your schools policy to think about, and you've got your health system to think about. They are good things to worry about. These are, these are things you would worry about from a position of strength, not weakness, but they are very difficult issues because it's very difficult to convince politicians in this environment that they may need to spend a bit more in the short term to make sure that we don't start losing touch with a new arrival. Now, if I were writing this piece, and I'm writing a piece for the New York Times in a couple of days' time, I would be saying that Australia has already won because the rest of the world is projecting success onto us. And how do we know this? Because of the population flow. If you broke down the ethnic composition of the United States at the moment, there are only 13% overseas born nationally to our 28, where 10 of our 28 is from Asia, another nine is from Britain, New Zealand, South Africa, another five, well, four and a half, is from Europe, another two is from the Middle East. That's not a bad spread of people. If you're designing a country from scratch, it would look a little like Australia today. The United States is only 13 percentage points born overseas compared to our 28, and seven of that 13 is from Latin America, and most of them are from Mexico, where our Asian-born population is 10% is of the entire population, theirs is only four. Where our European-born population is four and a half, theirs is two. Where our Middle Eastern-born population is two, theirs is an asterisk. Europe, which is another story altogether, is having to deal with a refugee crisis, a quite substantial refugee crisis. Most of the migration flows in the world today are, are relatively speaking, regionalised. So Middle East and North Africa to Europe, Latin America to, to the United States, but the dominant flow in Australia is from China and, and India. That's why I say the world is projecting success onto us, but I think within your day jobs, the consequences of that success are probably more profound than, you, than you've probably been thinking of, 
because imagine a world 10 or 20 years from now where that 28% becomes 33% nationally. Because that's what the population story is telling you. When Melbourne is the biggest city in Australia again, when we're trying to fit the next 16 million people, the majority of which will be migrants, which takes our population from 24 to 40 million, where they choose to live is not really going to be an issue for them because, relatively speaking, coming from China or in India, Melbourne and Sydney, if it's a little more crowded, a little more congested, a little more expensive, is still going to feel like paradise to them. But to the rest of those cities, and we know the economist tells us this, every time it puts Melbourne at the top of the livability index, it does come with a warning that the cities that are in the top 10 tend to be very, very wealthy but low-density cities. New York and Paris and London are not in the top 10. They don't get anywhere close to the top 10 because there does come a tipping point and I think the uh, people who know about um, urban policy a lot better than I do will probably give you the micro detail, but it's around four or five million where cities become very, very difficult to manage. We are already in that space. We are at that tipping point today. Now, in the federal sphere, of course, the Treasury will tell you that they don't want to think about cities policy, but I think they know that they need to. Anyway, I'd just, there are some, 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 some top-of-mind thoughts about what the population story is telling you about what your job should be in the next 10 or 20 years, about what should anchor most of the public policy discussion. It's a different order of challenge to the story coming out of the 70s, but bearing in mind some of the lessons of the 70s is it did take another 20, minu uh, another 20 minutes, I said, another 20 years to bed down a lot of those big headline macro uh, policy reforms. Now, I'm going to talk politics now. I know Laura Tingle's got a speech to give, to, uh, I think it's tonight or tomorrow night? Tonight, I think it is. So I'll let her talk about the 2016 election in much more detail than me. But I'm going to, I'm going to pose the following question. And this is where I will reference uh, Donald Trump and I will reference Brexit more interestingly. Brexit's a much more interesting case study for us, I think, than, uh, than the Trump phenomena at the moment. I think uh, what you're seeing in the United States, their culture is always prone to a bit of rhetorical violence on some edge that Australia never really goes to. I know a few politicians have felt like they could do that in the past, but there isn't, there isn't a party base to be able to carry them over the line to government with that sort of, with that sort of attitude. But the Brexit story is an interesting story to me. When you break down that vote, those who chose to remain had a connection to Europe that was not just a literal connection to Europe, but in an identity sense, it was a connection to the, to the global economy. It was actually a connection to the 21st century. So the idea, the idea in a London that voted to remain, or a Liverpool or a Manchester that voted to remain, is that their kids would be all right in, a, uh, in, a, uh, in an Asian century. Now, when I actually look at, and I, it surprised me when I broke down these numbers, I'll just give you what London looks like today in terms of its ethnic mix. And the reason why I mention this is it's very familiar to people in Melbourne and Sydney. 37% of London today is born overseas. Just over 10 percentage points is born in Asia. 10 of that 37. Just under 10, sorry, just over 10 from Asia, just under 10 from Europe. You're describing Melbourne or Sydney today which is London. So five percentage points are from Africa, two are from the Middle East. By the way, the Anzacs, those of us born in New Zealand or Australia, are only 1% of the uh, London population. Now, the rest of England doesn't look anything like London. The rest of England isn't necessarily poorer, on average, than, the rest, than London, but the rest of England which has a much larger English-born population, doesn't feel like their kids are going to win in the 21st century. Now, some commentators want to describe that attitude as racist. I actually think that that's a, a very, very unproductive way to look at it. This is more about whether those parts of England feel connected, not just to Europe, but to the globe in the 21st century. And think about how difficult it is historically for the English to decide they wanted to close the door. We're talking, about, we're talking about a people that literally were the pioneers for globalisation in the 18th century. Literally. 
So there, there isn't a more open-minded people historically than the English, and they're out. They're out now. Of course, the Scots want to stay in, the Northern Irish want to stay in, the Welsh want to be out as well. Now, I look at Brexit, I look at Brexit, this is why I look at Brexit with this particular frame in mind. Do you think your kids stand a chance in the 21st century? Now, what parts of Australia look like that? We know that the southeast corner can't be that part of any, if it's, say, if there's a hypothetical referendum question in Australia, do you or don't you want to stay an active member of the 21st century? You don't think Victoria and New South Wales will vote yes. Sorry, you don't think they'd vote to leave. You might have a difficulty in New South Wales if an immigration story was run, because paradoxically, even though Sydney has the largest overseas-born population, the largest share of overseas-born of any of the capital cities, it's also the place politically where the greatest resistance to migration is. But other things being equal, you'd assume Victoria and New South Wales would vote to remain. How would South Australia vote? I'm going to leave that question to one side. How would Tasmania vote? I'm going to leave that question to one side. How do you think Western Australia and Queensland would vote? Okay, this is where Hanson is back. You would assume, and for cultural reasons, the Western Australians did want to uh, secede uh, a few decades ago, and some people in the Remain camp are looking at WA precedents to try and talk themselves out of leaving the European Union. There's a, a fairly senior Brit I was speaking to about this just the other month, but uh, I'm not sure that that argument is going to fly <laughs> in the UK today. Remember what the West Australians tried to do, but they wouldn't let them do it. Now, I'm going to walk through the election map in the most basic way. I'm going to divide the country up into three zones. Now, remember what I said before about how the population flow from overseas is creating literally three different ethnic identities in Australia? I'm now going to divide the electoral map, the federal electoral map, into three zones. I'm going to do it by state. So I'm going to put Victoria, New South Wales and the ACT in the southeast corner. And you know that's where more than half the nation's population is. So you know that's obviously where more than half the seats in the parliament of 150 reside. I'm going to put Queensland and WA in another corner. They're the former mining states, for want of, another, um, for want of a better caricature. And then there's the bit in the middle, which is Tasmania, South Australia and the Northern Territory. And we know, in terms of socio-economic profile, this is the disadvantaged centre of Australia. Not the middle of Australia, but geographically the disadvantaged centre of Australia. Now, let's play the simplest game we can play and figure out who won the election in those three zones of Australia. And the reason why I'm asking you to think of it in these terms is imagine if this was a vote to leave or to remain. I imagine if the vote for the conservative side of politics was a vote to leave. Forget that Malcolm Turnbull was the leader and just imagine, generally speaking, that a conservative voter, other things being equal, will be more likely than not to vote to leave because that's what a conservative voter did in Britain. And the people who voted for the Labor Party or the Greens would, would want to remain in the 21st century. Now, I'm going to start at the bottom, in the bottom corner, which is Victoria, New South Wales and the ACT. I'm going to get these numbers right because some of you may want to take them down. 86 of the 150 seats in the federal parliament are in that southeast corner. I'm going to take you back two elections. Remember why Julia Gillard just fell over the line? She was able to hold a majority of seats in Victoria, New South Wales, South Australia and Tasmania. And she got smashed in Queensland and Western Australia. She didn't win a majority of seats, but she was able to hold on to government because there was an anchor to the Labor Party vote in the bottom half of Australia, geographically speaking. Now, of the 86 seats in the southeast corner, the Labor Party at the last election, this is with Bill Shorten and the leader running a scare campaign, won 44 of the 86 seats. The coalition won 40. By the way, this is the first time in federal history that the party that won the majority of seats in Victoria and New South Wales did not get to form the government. So 44 out of the 86 went Labor. I'm now going to look at the centre, which is South Australia, Tasmania and the Northern Territory. There are just 18 seats there. Labor won 12 of the 18. So you know the Coalition won no seats at all 
in Tasmania, none in the Northern Territory, and just lost government in the Northern Territory, and they only won the four here in South Australia. So again, your most disadvantaged part of Australia has voted Labor overwhelmingly, but they didn't get to decide who won the election. The reason why the coalition were re-elected, and when I look at this particular number, I wonder why people are telling Malcolm Turnbull that he had betrayed the conservative wing of the coalition. Because in Queensland and Western Australia, where there are just under a third of all the people in Australia and just under a third of all the seats, only 46 of the 150 seats, the coalition won 32 of the 46. That's, that's what saved them. Those two, seats, those two states alone saved them. Now, we haven't had a position before in Australia where the government is anchored in just two states. That's never happened before. Now, in 2010, of course, we thought 2010 was dysfunctional because we had the mining states breaking off to the Conservative side and the southeast corner sticking with the Labor Party, and we know that that parliament was unmanageable. We know when we look at the Senate that one of the reasons why Pauline Hanson back, is back is exactly this dynamic I'm describing, which is the mining states have moved not off the grid, but they are to the right of the rest of the country, but relatively speaking, the rest of the country is to the left of the mining state, so the government has formed with a majority of seats in the lower house. Two states are dictating that. Now, I think a lot of people in Canberra are not aware of this particular thing because most of the rhetoric coming out of the last election was, oh, well, Labor ran a scare campaign on Medicare, or that's the excuse for the coalition not winning uh, by more than one seat. Within the coalition, there's clearly some sort of ideological tussle going on, and they're saying, well, Malcolm didn't honour the conservative side. He would have won more seats if he'd been a little more conservative in his uh, disposition. I actually think the problem for him, which was a not dissimilar problem that Gillard had, is that when you don't offer the people an active choice, they default to tribal party identity. Now, there's a whole other uh, 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 sort of library of literature about the breakdown in the uh, primary vote of the two major parties. I'm less concerned about that in this instance than I am about how the seats have distributed geographically. Now, nationally, we'd like to see stable government. We'd like to see the winner of an election look forward to at least two terms. We'd like them to go to work the next day after they've uh, read their incoming briefs, knowing that the first 18 months of, this, of, the, of their first term is about governing. The next 18 months might be about re-election, but they can reasonably expect to look forward to being there for at least two terms to be able to get their agenda better down. We would like, and this is how politics used to work, we'd like the other side having been defeated at the ballot box and having needed at least two terms to figure out what went wrong and how to make themselves acceptable to the electorate again, that they would reconnect with the population and figure out what would move them to reinstall them as the government. In that process of exchange, you'd hope there'd be some continuity between one government to the next. At the moment, because we're spinning very quickly, uh, this is not just at the federal level, we see this a lot now in Victoria especially, an incoming government looks at, its previous, at the previous government and gender and, and thinks, that's what defines me. I'm going to spend the next three or four years trying to undo what they did. So you get an example in Victoria where Public transport drives the decision to throw out the Brumby government in 2010. The coalition spends four years trying to figure out what its transport plan is, goes to, uh, goes to the East Link, which is a roads, uh, the answer to the question congestion equals just roads. The Labor Party looks at that, says, no, no, we'll make it a referendum because we think it's um, rail. They win. The previous four years is wasted. For the, for the people of Victoria. They're going to waste how, how, much, how much thought time trying to unpick a contract so then they can proceed to their agenda. Could you imagine Robert Menzies telling Ben Chifley, and they were quite friendly outside of, um, outside of the political contest, could you imagine Menzies telling Chifley in 49, sorry champ, Snow Mountain Scheme might look good on paper, but I'm going to spend the next three years figuring out what our agenda is. That's not the way politics should ever be played, but it's something that is occurring today because of many cultural, technological reasons.
Um, when I talk about, I'm going to bring it back to the start, when I talk about needing to anchor public debate, the thing that should anchor public debate is that we are moving from a population of 24 to 40 in the next 20 to 30 years. So that's sort of the, um, it's a bit on the high side for 2050, but let's say we're, even if it were at 35 million. Big questions. Knowing that a lot of the people who are coming are going to be better qualified than the existing population, knowing that everybody's going to have to live somewhere, knowing that you've got physical infrastructure, you've also got the cohesion question, how do people keep up, knowing also that you've got some extreme pockets of disadvantage in Australia today that the political system does not know how to cope with, imagine how difficult the debate will be in 10 or 20 years' time if you haven't told your ministers, plural, that we didn't think far enough ahead to realise that there'd come a day in the future um, when there is a Eurasian identity, the Asian part are the winners, the European part or the Anglo part is OK in some pockets, but in other pockets we've got people who, who used to feel like Australia belonged to them no longer belongs to them. What are you going to do then? I mean, it's too late then to have that discussion. I think the early warning in the election result of 2010 and 2016 is that without an active choice, without a political party that wants to take its base and add to it, I, what Malcolm Turnbull looked like briefly when not just Queensland and Western Australian voters were going to stick to the coalition but he was going to add people in New South Wales and Victoria, what Kevin Rudd actually looked like for a couple of years where a Queenslander was able to bring New South Wales and Victoria into the um, into the labour fold. If people don't think nationally and they don't think in terms of uh, now a multiple ethnic identity for Australia, uh, we are almost in a permanent state of volatility. Now that permanent state of volatility, we've been able to muddle through it up until this point, but I'm not sure, say if we had this conversation 10 years from now and the politics still looks like it does today, that we'd be better off 10 years from now. Um, I'll leave that as the final thought because I know we've got, um, we've got a panel to flesh out some of these issues. Thank you very much. Is New Zealand's so-called special bond with Australia a thing of the past? The number of Kiwis granted permanent residency in Australia has plummeted from a high of 2,500 in 2012-13 to just 45 in the eight months to February this year. From next January, New Zealanders who are permanent residents of Australia will have to pay full fees for university, an average increase of eight to nine thousand Australian dollars a year. Last month, the Australian government also announced stricter citizenship rules, raising fears that an agreement for a pathway to Australian citizenship for New Zealanders would be undermined. After a meeting between the two foreign ministers, Jerry Brownlee and Julie Bishop, the situation was clarified. The pathway to citizenship remains. But the Prime Minister Bill English acknowledged that there's still uncertainty about the direction Australia is headed in vis-a-vis -vis Kiwi expats. As well, in 2015, Australia changed its law to allow the expulsion of foreign nationals who had served sentences of 12 months or longer, no matter how long they had lived in Australia, leading to hundreds of returnees, some of whom had not lived in New Zealand since infancy. The lobby group Oz Kiwi says life in Australia for New Zealanders has become uncertain and difficult. What lies ahead for the hundreds of thousands, perhaps 600,000 New Zealanders who've made the lucky country their home? Our guest is Bernard Salt, a demographer, author, social commentator, Melbourne-based partner with the global advisory firm KPMG and adjunct professor at Curtin University Business School. Bernard, good morning. Good to talk to you. Hi, Catherine. It's feeling like the not-so-lucky country at the moment for uh, New Zealanders. If you step back and look at what's been happening over perhaps 15 years, actually, but more recently in particular, what is driving this? Look, there, there has been a, um, a fund fundamental shift in the Australian demography, uh, certainly over the last 10 years or so. Uh, preliminary results from the 2016 census released one month ago showed something quite unique uh, that had emerged for the first time. The western half of the country, Western Australia, South Australia and the Northern Territory, still has a very strong Anglo base. We draw our migrants uh, from Anglo countries. The eastern side of the nation, particularly Victoria and New South Wales, are more likely to be Indian and Chinese. The, so the ethnic base, the source from which we are drawing migrants, has profoundly shifted over the last decade or so. And I will say also that 
the, the flow of Kiwis themselves uh, has reversed uh, since the earthquake, the reconstruction phase, and a new energy that seems to be uh, associated with New Zealand. Uh, the numbers have been flowing in the other direction, in fact. So it's almost like there's a there, there seems to be a, a, a demographic basis to a uh, uh, to, to a part, not a parting of the ways, but just uh, a slowing of the bombs that have been there, literally for since uh, since settlement. The Trans Tasman migration is often very much driven by economic opportunities. So when there was a mining boom, a lot of Kiwis headed Aussies way. In fact, five years ago we were going, why are so many New Zealanders pouring, pouring out of the country? Why are we having net immigration? Well, net migration losses. Now, of course, we're at record levels of migration, a mix of Kiwis coming home and uh, others wanting to come here. So given that the economics will often drive the flows, what is driving the politics, and particularly the more recent politics, the last two to three years? Well, I, I, I do think that there is a... Um, I, I do think that the demographics are absolutely important. Our, our shift in focus towards Asia in fact, uh, with the Chinese, the Indians. So I'm not, I'm not convinced that this is so much a rejection uh, of New Zealand as uh, a shift or a pivot towards Asia. There was a shift, in fact, uh, between Australia and the UK back in the 1960s when the UK, of course, joined the, uh, the EU. Australians were mightily offended at the time, but in actual fact, uh, this was simply a shift in, uh, in that country's alignment to its local region. In some respects, you could argue a similar thing is happening today. It's not so much a rejection of New Zealand. It's a pivot towards Asia, Asian migration, Asian students, Asian visitation, in fact. Uh, our focus, our attention has been taken by, South, by Southeast Asia and as a consequence, uh, the politics may well flow as a, uh, out of that uh, shift in thinking. It's a fine point, and it's one that, that's, that's absolutely understandable where the attention is, but what is disappearing apace, and I said over 15 years, if you go back to John Howard's decisions, I think 2001 or 2002, the decision uh, that was going to limit some New Zealanders' uh, rights there, entitlements there, and then some of the more recent decisions uh, as well. It's that the idea of New Zealanders being special amongst a migration flow <laughs> or there being a special entitlement is disappearing apace. And I, I think what surprised many, even two or three years ago, I, I was speaking to an academic here who had done research on it, was that the freedom of movement of people is nowhere in any formal agreement. It was a handshake uh, between uh, Gough Whitlam and Norman Kirk in the early 70s that was expressed in a communique and it was always a matter of goodwill. 